Well, hello there, you lovely lot. I hope you've all been well and keeping out of trouble. A big welcome back to you and a big hello and welcome to anyone who's tuning in for the first time. Now, I'm not sure if you've all been following the socials, but if you haven't, I just wanted to let you know that a few weeks ago, we uploaded some episodes of the show onto YouTube. So if you want to watch the show, you can. And because video editing is a bit of a bitch compared to audio, you might even find some bonus content in the videos that didn't quite make it into the final audio cut. So when you get a chance, please go and check out the show over on YouTube. The YouTube channel is, excuse me, I have something to say. Leave a like, a comment, a review, and remember to click on that subscribe button and turn on all notifications. Coming up on the show today, my very special guest and I are getting personal as we take a look into the body positivity movement and talk about a few other body image issues and topics such as body acceptance and body neutrality. As mentioned, I have a very special guest joining me this week, a fan favorite who just keeps coming back for more and who is always sporting a fabulous new look with every episode. And I am here for it, particularly this one. Please welcome back to the show someone very special to me and to the show, the always funny, always engaging host of the podcast may contain traces of soy, my friend and yours, Miss Rochelle Lindquist. Hi, Rochelle. Thank you so much for having me on. I feel like there should have been a swell of, you know, applause from the crowd at that point, you know, so let's add that in later. I totally, you know what, I totally thought that when I was reading it, I'm like, I should totally put like a sound effect in here of like everybody clapping Do because it. it's well deserved. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for having me on. I'm so psyched to be here today. I'm incredibly passionate about body positivity and body acceptance. And it's been a long journey for me um, coming into the world, you know, and being in the world, existing in a larger body. So psyched to get into it. I'm super excited for us to tackle this topic. But before we get stuck into it, let's take a a quick little second to talk about my second favorite podcast. Obviously, this is my first. Uh, Your podcast may contain traces of soy. You are back with season three of the show, Living in Tassie. How is it all going? Where can the people catch you? Give us all the info. Go. (laughs) Well, yes, we are back. We're doing season three now of Make Teen Traces of Soy. We are dropping an episode weekly on Fridays. They'll be there every Friday morning on all your favorite podcasting platforms. You can find us on Instagram at Make Teen Traces of Soy and on Facebook. But to be honest, guys, we are much more active on Instagram. Um, and that is really where like everyone congregates to kind of talk and stuff there. But definitely go check out the show and check out the YouTube as well. So we've started a YouTube account to go along with the show. We're doing you know, complimentary videos. Uh, This week's video had nothing to do with the podcast episode. It was me dyeing my (laughs) hair pink and it's amazing. And you should go check it out. That's the Vegan Shell channel, but we'll drop a link in the show notes, guys. Today, we're having a little chat about body positivity. This is a topic that I've wanted to discuss on the show since season one. Um, I've had it penciled in for each season so far, but just never really got to it. Never really found an angle that I thought sort of represented the conversation as I wanted to have it. Um, Shell, as one of the most positive, honest and forward thinking people I know, your name has always been attached to this conversation for me. Uh, So thank you for coming back on the show to have this conversation. Um, But yeah, I'm so excited that we're about to do this. So there are really three parts to, to the angle of this conversation that I'm wanting us to touch on. Um, Obviously it's the conversation is larger than anything we're going to tackle on today's show. But um, the three touch points that I want to talk about are briefly our body positivity, of course, body acceptance and body neutrality. So let's start us off, Rochelle Ellington, with a very honest question that I want to ask for both of us. Um, I will throw you under the bus first. How do you feel about your body? I mean, that is a question uh, where the answer can change on the daily. It can change moment to moment. Um, And it's definitely changed a lot throughout my life. 
So I feel as though at this point in my life, I am in a pretty good place with my body. I'm actually pretty comfortable with it, pretty happy existing in it. Um, and it's, it's a complex kind of question. I think uh, right now, I, I, I like my body. I appreciate everything that it does for me, but I don't have massively strong feelings one direction or another. If I'm naked and dancing in the kitchen, then that moment, I fucking love my body. And I'm like, look, is it jiggle? You know, watch the <laughs> yes. fire shake. Yes, girl. Um, I enjoy that. I really enjoy, you know, existing in my body in those moments. And there are moments where I exist in my body where I'm like walking upstairs and I'm like, I'm out of breath. I should really be better to my body. I feel a bit unfit right now. You know, I should be treating it better. I'm leaning on some vices too much. And, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed in my body's performance at times, but overall I'm pretty, I'm pretty accepting. I would say of my body, I'm probably neutral to positive the majority of the time. Um, but if you had all this, you would be, you know what I'm saying? But how about you? Where are you at with your body? Uh, look again, I think, uh, same sentiment as you to start with it very much varies from day to day example the other day uh, very unhealthily uh let's call it a fast it was an accidental fast I hadn't eaten anything all day and I had that hunger feeling and I was like I'm feeling good like I feel like I feel like I'm thin you know because everybody wants us to be thin all the time uh even though I'm not and wasn't and that's fine but um, yeah, like on that day, I was feeling like that. And then the next day, you know, I had some toast for breakfast and, you know, just healthy. And that day I, I didn't like myself. Um, I was like, today I feel fat and bloated. My clothes don't fit. I don't feel comfortable. Um, I would say for me and my own body issues, which I've spoken about, you know, eating disorders and things on the show before, I've got a very, as we all do, a very complex relationship with my body um and very much spend a lot of my time going my body's not good enough my body could be better and that's physically in terms of you know what society tells us we should look like as men women and everyone in between but in terms of health wise I obviously for me I, I need to be out I need to be being more active than I am just for my own body's health but I love and appreciate my body for all it does, you know, from being able to digest food healthily to being, you know, to lucky enough to be able to, I guess, live in what is a quote unquote, there you go, quote unquote, normal body in the sense that it functions the way it should. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I hear you for all of those things. And I think that um, if you want to dive right into it, like mm. something that has informed my practice of actively and recklessly trying to like love my body, however it is, wherever it's at, that has come from a place of, you know, having gone through periods of disordered eating. And I am constantly catching myself almost falling into disordered eating habits again. Um, in both kind of extreme directions uh, because my relationship with food is fucked up like so, like it is for so many people like my relationship with food is fucked up like um, you know I it's the enemy it's everything it's emotional comfort it's something to be avoided at all costs like I have some issues to unpack and I'm actually booked in to start seeing a psychologist down here specifically because I want to address some of this stuff um, and, you know, a few other things like imposter syndrome, but I've just decided I've hit a point where I really need to actually talk that through in therapy properly because I'm just, you know, forever in those cycles and I'm trying very hard to break out of it. So I still managed to fall into those cycles while still loving my body, <laughs> which is insane. Um, but controlling food, I find to be a very uh, seductive way of handling stress. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, feel that as well. Yeah. I mean, I often make the joke and I probably shouldn't joke, but I make the joke and I guess it's a joke to me because it's a coping mechanism where I will often say, I'm eating my feelings this week and I'm having a lot of feelings. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes things are funny. Um, a buffet of feelings. But, uh, 
yeah or you can eat buffet i go into town um i yeah very um very bad joke in poor taste so i apologize if that joke offends anybody but i feel it's a very relatable sentiment so a little history lesson the body positivity movement um it's been around for ages i didn't know this i, I mean i guess on some degree, I've always thought it would have been around for ages, but the movement itself, um, it's not just a conversation that we've been having recently, although the conversation has evolved throughout the years, the origins of the body positive movement can be traced all the way back to the 1850s to the 1890s with something called the Victorian Dress Reform Movement. Do you know of this? No, I didn't. I was going to start talking about the fat positivity movement of the 60s and the fat ends. Oh, we'll totally but, get to that in just one sec. But yeah. so in the 1850s, 1890s, a Victorian dress reform movement formed part of the first wave of feminism. Um, and it was aimed at putting an end to the need for women to use things like corsets and tight lacing on their bodies in order to satisfy the social standard of the time for women to have tiny, tiny waistlines. So wow. there's a, a little history lesson for you that I was not aware of that I found incredibly interesting. I guess like we hear about, you know, women fighting the, the fashion industry and, and whatever with the use of corsets in the past. Um, but to think of it as they trace it back to the start of body positivity, who knew? Not me. No, that's amazing. I was not aware of that. Um, it's, although... It makes a lot of sense because you had the suffragette movement happening. Um, you know, this was kind of, and there is so much in that, that we can, like, we don't have time to unpack how problematic that was as a result of the time from which it occurred. You know, they were very much fighting for the rights only of like white uh, upper middle-class women. That was their main concern. And there was no kind of concept of understanding the privilege that they had in society. But of course, these movements are all affected by where they start. They're colored by the time they exist in. It's interesting though, because it was something that was bad for female bodies, the tight lacing, the excessive corsetry and stuff. And that can be done in a safe way. I know people in the body positivity movement who enjoy corseting and it's like a part of what they do, but they're just you know aware of what they're doing and they're doing it for an interest in bodily autonomy and expression rather than about, you know, meeting, because honestly, that's not a standard for women these days for no. beauty. Like there aren't dudes going, oh, you need to be corseted for me to want to get into that waspy waist. It's like, no, this is usually a queer non-binary person being like, this is part of performance, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's different these days. But back then, like they were very much hurting themselves. They were, you know, causing problems. Organs were shifting around, bones were, you know, breaking in cases. So yeah, sounds yeah. normal. Sounds healthy. Yeah, just about. <laughs> so you were going to talk about the which movement from the 60s, did you say? The fat positivity movement. So I'd like to make a note here in the show and talk about how body positivity movement, body neutrality, and body acceptance, all wonderful movements, but we should acknowledge that there is a separate movement to this called the fat positivity movement. And that actually started, I mean, I'm sure it was, you know, around to some degree before that, but there in the 1960s, there was a journalist who realized that people were, he was like an overweight person himself. His wife was overweight and she was getting bullied at work and treated differently for being fat. And he started looking into it, researching it, writing stuff. And they formed a um, body over in the US. I can't remember what it was called because I didn't do this research beforehand. I've just <laughs> read about it in the past. Um, but yeah, it was like basically uh, for the rights of fat people. And they had a fat in, kind of like there was a bee in in San Francisco. They had a fat in um, somewhere. So hold on. What does that mean? What's like, it, like a sit in? Uh, well, they all sat, they all sat together with like signs about how it's okay to be oh. fat, basically. Yeah, they existed in the world. Um, so I feel as though it's important to note that there's a difference between, you know, being sort of uh, in the body positivity movement and being in the fat positivity movement, because there are people who exist in larger bodies. I have what they would call a mid-size to large body, you know, so um, because I'm not in the top ranges of what, you know, people can get to, but I'm not right down here being normal size or skinny um, and normal is a problematic term, but we're talking average here. 
Um, I'm in that kind of mid-size area, anywhere from sort of a 14 to like an 18, which is what they call mid-size. Um, and that is, yeah, that's a different world to exist in than being in the fat positivity movement, which is very much about celebrating your larger body um, and, you know, being able to take up space because the body positivity movement often it often, even though they're trying to do the right thing, and obviously everyone has a right to feel positive about their body, I don't think that should be taken away from everyone um, or anyone for that matter. It's still a case of um, you see attractive, slightly overweight, mid-size, or like people with just a little bit of cellulite, and that's you know representing the um, body positivity movement a lot of the time. And that deserves a place. But for people in much larger bodies, they kind of go, I don't see myself represented in this movement. And I don't feel as though I'm welcome here because you guys still, you know, they're not kind of a lot of people in the body positivity movement might not be radically focused on trying to eradicate judgment of all bodies, but rather just celebrating their personal experience or the other bodies around them. And anytime we kind of go, oh, I'm body positive, but as long as you're healthy, you're mm -hmm. kind of like it's an ableist statement at the end of the day, because if you're going to reject larger bodies from that movement, you're not really letting everyone into it. And I feel as though no matter what's going on, everyone should be welcomed into that movement. So they're just to talk about the separations between those different movements. I got right off track there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's funny because I like obviously Hollywood has a lot to answer for magazines have a lot to answer for fashion industry beauty industries all of these places um haven't always shown the diversity of humans on this planet I remember being little and you know you'd hear, often you'd hear people say particularly if it was at school and there was bullying or you know fat shaming and you know that sort of bullying at school teachers and parents would always be like, you know, you have to respect that everybody is different and people come in all shapes and sizes and colors and creeds and all of the things. And that's like a narrative that I think I've grown up with. And I don't really think until not like right now, but in the past probably 10 years that the rest of the world is playing by that rule in or starting to mm. um, and, and sort of, you know, showcasing the multifaceted, beautiful, different shapes of colors and, you know, races and all, all of the people and genders and everybody that's out there is starting to see more and more of it. And I appreciate that and I like it. And I wish that, you know, a little me got exposed to a lot more of that a lot sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Representation. Um, in the media is so incredibly important because I, and I am just a mid-size, like privileged white woman. And I did not see another woman like myself being celebrated. One of the only people I could point to, one of the only examples in media that I saw growing up where it was a overweight woman who was still the star of the show and who was still attractive was Miss Piggy. That is one of the only body positive plus size examples I could see as a child. Um, fat women who were around, plus size women who were around back then, no one was ever as plus size as me. And if they were, they covered them up in massive oversized shirts. And it was a huge butt of the joke that they were so fat. And it was like, she's the fat friend. She's funny. That's what she gets to be. And that was all I saw. And I was just like, this, why is there not, you know, because... I had main <laughs> I had main character syndrome from a very young age. And I was like, I am the star of the show. Why isn't there someone out there that looks like me? You know, I was like, uh, I am the shit. Why are they not around? <laughs> so yeah, I kind of didn't see that. And it it has only really changed in the last few years that we've started to have people. And even like then, it is still so often a part of their character arc or narrative that they are fat and that it affects like their lives it's like for once can we just have a larger body when they being in a larger body is not some kind of a massive you know moment in the show like oh she's fat isn't it amazing it's like no fuck off just yeah. well it's let people exist exactly it's <laughs> it's funny because we have conversations that are similar in in our household obviously being a very gay household hey um 
you know, Benny and I will often watch queer movies and it's not like it's getting better, but we would often watch queer movies and be like, how come everything has to be centered around, um, you know, HIV and AIDS? Why can't we just have a regular old little, you know, Drew Barrymore rom-com style movie uh, that's just accepting and reflective of of now obviously don't want to take anything away from from our queer history and you know what the AIDS epidemic was it was massive and and you know pivotal but you know it would be nice to not cry with sad tears at every queer movie so you know, I feel what you're saying as, as somebody, you know, a woman in a larger body and I find it really, really kind of sad that, you know, Miss Piggy as fabulous as she is, was mm. really the only person that you could look up to in somebody who you could identify with. And it's an interesting point that you make and just sidebarring off topic for a second, it was on the news, I think last week, that the representation in kids books that are presented to kids in school needs to change and there was a lot of talk around the fact that you know marginalized communities yeah sure you're getting great wonderful books like possum magic and things like that that are sort of you know what's the word I'm looking for I don't know but quintessentially Australian kids books and they're in every school But a lot of, you know, the young kids of colour are finding representation in an animal, not in a human. Mm. And although they humanised Miss Piggy and you found representation for larger bodies with Miss Piggy, it still had to be a cartoony puppet animal. A cartoon pig too. It was a cartoon pig. Um, And I can remember being quite young and thinking the worst thing in the world would be to, you know, for people to think of me like I was a pig, like I was fat. I remember thinking that's the worst thing that you can be, even though I knew it was what I was inherently. Like I was a chubby child my whole life. I was like taller than everyone else, bigger than everyone else, fatter than everyone else. And it was just something that I was aware of from such a young age. And it's funny because I don't know when I became fully aware of it, but probably before I went to primary school, it was not something I really thought about. And it was only once I was in primary school, socialized with other children who would point out that I was different and they would make fun of me for being fat, that it occurred to me that it was bad to be fat. Um, And as you get older and these gender roles and this like, you know, imprint of what an adult um you know what kind of adult you will be is placed on you from such a young point like she'll be a heartbreaker or he's gonna you know have all the ladies after him, all that kind of crap that heteronormative bullshit that society does I think it places it on you so early that you know you're already kind of expected to yeah be dealing with that but one interesting thing I can kind of refer to in terms of like being a small child and you know being like dealing with all of that was when I was, I think only maybe four or five, it was before I'd gone to primary school, my sister had been doing ballet lessons and mom was like, well, we'll put Rochelle in for ballet too. And so she put me in for ballet and I was in the class for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden she pulled me out and I wasn't going to be in the class anymore. And I was like, oh, okay. I really liked it though. I thought it was fun. Like I enjoyed being in ballet. And I found out recently that the reason why she pulled me out was because the teacher had body shamed me and said, Rochelle, didn't, she's not going to look right in the, um, you know, we're not going to give her the same costume as the other girl. She's not going to look right in it because I was a chubby little kid with a fat little belly and they didn't want me to look like the other ballerinas in the show. They were going to give me a different costume or something. And mom was like, we're not doing this. I and on your mom, but- I think... Yes, but she internalized some of that because I was put on diets the rest of my life. Like I remember from a really young age being like on diets and I think she internalized that, you know, idea that it would be hard for me if I was fat. But also there's probably... She was like, I'll try and fix it. There there may have also been a level of, you know, your teacher fat shamed you, you're the ballet teacher, to your mother, which probably made your mum question a little bit perhaps, and this is speculation of whether or not she was doing a 
good enough job as a mum because her daughter was, you know, society standards considered overweight. Like, and then what's the what's the fallout from that, from this one ballet teacher, is that she then puts all of these thoughts on your mum, who then tries to do what she probably thinks is the right thing, which is to help get your weight down. Mm. And I mean, that's just open that can of worms. Like that's crazy. Yeah. Your poor mum. Well, what you yeah. I mean, I think my mom probably, like all women who grew up when she did, you know, being sort of born in the 50s, young in the 70s and 80s, like, of course, there was a lot of internalized, Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of fat phobia that she would carry with her and all of those kind of issues. Um, But yeah, when I was, I think like when I was a kid and stuff and she was putting me on those diets, the funny thing was when I was in primary school and I would constantly be put on diets, I was eating what the rest of the kids in the house would eat. Cause I have five siblings and we were also all very active at one point in primary school. Like when I was 10, 11, 12, 13 sort of time, I was doing four different classes. So I did karate and jujitsu and Iaido. So that's three martial arts. And then for a little don't while, I did belly Michelle dancing. Can, she'll beat you up. Yeah. Don't mess with me. <laughs> but I did all of those classes and I did belly dancing and I would like, you know, do flips and I was really flexible and I was eating the same stuff everyone else ate. And my weight never dropped below what was considered on the BMI scale to be overweight, borderline obese. Like that was just where I sat. And whenever we go see the doctor, they would do tests and they would say, well, everything came back and you're very healthy, but you're still overweight and you still have to lose weight. And mom would be like, all right, so we'll try another diet. And I, I understood and I knew what calories were in like everything and rice crackers and fruit. And I was eating less than like, I was eating a thousand calories a day for like long stretches as a child, like as an 11 year old child, um, trying to lose weight and I would lose a couple of kilos, but if I ate like a human being again, it would come back and it was just very, you know, hard and it was always an issue And um, yeah, it was a strange thing. I don't think any 12 year old kid should know how many calories are in a rice cake. It's just not, it's not cool. Hey, (laughs) no, it's not cool. It's problematic. Kids that kids that age should just be out having a good time or these days scrolling through TikTok. Um, (laughs) But then that's a problem in itself because have you Uh, seen the people on TikTok? Exactly. Um, Okay, so who are some people that you think are positive ambassadors for body positivity movement? People who are, I guess, doing it the right way, celebrating it the right way. Um, I would say go and check out. She used to be called Body Positive Panda. Now she goes by her full name, which is Megan Jane Crab. And I will do a link to her Instagram. She's got a book and she's actually a recoverer of eating disorders. So she had gone through periods in her life where she had anorexia and, you know, the difference is shocking, like what, you know, how bad she had gotten. And she's been a body positive advocate for a long time now. She does great stuff online and she's really wonderful and just really good at, you know, getting the message out there in a way that's really healthy to absorb as well. Um, And then Jamila Jamil, I love, and obviously Lizzo, I think is an absolute queen. So those mm-hmm. three would be my picks. I love it. Um, how? Let's just sit with Lizzo for a minute because she mm. she's very good. She's very like musically, she's incredible, and yes. she's so body positive. And yes, it's and like, she's so fucking hot. I think Lizzo might be one of the first women I've seen in a large body, not just a mid sized body, who makes um you know she makes everyone hot under the collar she people are turned on by her and I, they don't I think they struggle with it I think there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the fact that she makes them excited and like you know turned on because they're like but it doesn't make sense to me society's told me you can't be hot and she's like oh I am <laughs> I really am <laughs> look at me and she is fit as fuck like she you is. cannot dance around on a stage like that in the smaller bodies oh. let alone a larger body and not be fit and healthy oh, fuck yeah like 100% like she is twerking and playing the flute and rapping all in the space of a couple of minutes in a lot of her shows 
to be able to do all of that, you need to be incredibly fit. But I think that one thing we should be aware of is that we should never be deciding whether or not like being fit shouldn't be a qualifier to whether or not you can celebrate your body. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I feel like that happens a lot where we go, oh, but they're healthy. So it's okay. It's like, it's not anyone's business, whether someone's healthy, they should be happy and happy to be in that body, whether they're feeling healthy or not. Because when we qualify body positivity as only being something for people who are quote unquote healthy or fit, then we say that if you're unhealthy, you shouldn't be happy in your body, which makes it harder to do anything to focus on making it healthier and to love yourself no matter where you're at in your journey. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just jealous of Lizzo. Like if I could dance around on a stage like that. I would... Oh my God. 100%. Like what a queen. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> she is amazing. Um, so the second point that I wanted to touch on is body acceptance. So I found this really great website and I can't think what it's called off the top of my head, but I'll put a link to it in the show notes that had um, a couple of sort of differences between, or I guess, definitions of the three uh, parts of the topic. So body acceptance is the second one. So the difference between body positivity and body acceptance is that with body acceptance, you don't have to be thrilled with your body like every minute, but instead you can figure out how to accept it. So this may be especially helpful for those who are in recovery as it doesn't require body love which can feel like an overwhelming goal. Some think that body positivity does not leave room for insecurities and frustrations and that loving your body every day is not realistic. Alternatively, acceptance is treating our bodies with respect and care, including all of our deepest insecurities and knowing that some days will be harder than others. In the end, body acceptance is about reflecting on why you feel negatively towards your body and how you can find peace with your body without needing to change it. What do you think to that? I think that's such an important point because I don't think that any of us are feeling positive about our body 100% of the mm -hmm. time. And body acceptance is a much more realistic goal because there are times like we spoke about at the start of the episode where I'm elated and excited and completely in love with my body and the way it moves. And then other times I'm very like, you know, I'm just okay with you. I'm feeling quite neutral about you today. But um, yeah, I think that that really honors the truth of our emotions and where we're at in different phases with our bodies and with our body image issues, because we still have them no matter where we're at. And I think that that's such an important place to kind of come from the conversation too. I actually... I have found recently that I have been, so I started doing YouTube, like I was talking about earlier, only a few weeks ago. And when I originally started Make Teen Trace to Soy, I did start a YouTube like halfway through that year. And I think I put up one video. And every time I tried to record a video, I actually found that I was uncomfortable with looking at my body as I moved about the video. I was uncomfortable with seeing when I'd get a double chin and things like that from the position, because when you take a photo, you can obviously pose and stay and it looks good. But when you're actually moving around, you have like awkward angles. And I wasn't ready to deal with that two years ago. I wasn't in a place where I could handle it. I was probably five, 10 kilos lighter than I am now then too but I was just not happy to accept what, where I was at then. So doing video again now, I'm actually just in a different place with my body where I'm comfortable accepting it as it is. And I've decided that my desire to put, you know, content out there and create stuff and have a place where I can, you know, share stuff and share my opinion and make content it trumps my uncomfortableness over how my body looks. And to hit that point is quite a moment for me, especially existing in a slightly larger body than I was even two years ago. And that's interesting. Um, I think that's a good example of how I've come to be a little bit more neutral about my body than I was, because it's not about being wildly excited over how I look in the videos. It's more about just being like, I deserve a place to exist and my body deserves to be on at its size now. hundred percent. We yeah. talk about body positivity and a lot of people, when they hear body positivity, they automatically go to 
visualizing people in larger bodies accepting their bodies but one of the things in terms of body positivity and body acceptance that I'm struggling with at the minute is getting older like Mm. my you sure my body's changing but on top of that my face is changing and my hair is graying and my beard is graying and we you know there is this constant battle to stay young and to stay relevant um yes. and that's 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 what I struggle with um I had a conversation with a friend of mine who works in hair the other day and I was like so I feel like I should embrace my gray because everybody on social media is like oh you should embrace the gray hair and I'm like but how do I do that because I don't think I'm ready to be as gray as I am right now and he was just like if you're not ready just don't don't even worry just like keep doing what you're doing and stay comfortable um but yeah getting older that opens up the conversation there to toxic positivity doesn't it because it's like you are told and we are seen through social media you should be embracing your grays you should age gracefully you should embrace you know makeup free selfies and let your gray hair come in and like love the fat body that you're in and it's like that's toxic positivity because you're telling me if I don't do this, then I'm not like, you know, doing things right by myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And toxic positivity is one of the things that I wanted us to touch on because there is that, it's almost like if something swings so far one way, it goes back and swings the other way. And the whole movement itself for body positivity seems to have gone from celebrating bodies in all shapes and forms and sizes and ages and everything to, um yeah it's just gone to that toxic place where Mm. I mean I don't don't even know how to talk about it it's just like it's just one of those things that I find incredibly frustrating and there's a lot of people out there who produce content that plays on everybody else's insecurities Mm. yeah and it's really disappointing to see that and it's also Like I personally feel that the body positivity movement is a place for everyone, um, which is different to the fat positivity movement, which is obviously a space for fat bodies to celebrate. And that's, they should have that space. They should have a safe space that's separate, um, you know, but the body positivity movement should be a place where whoever you are, whatever you're struggling with, you should have a space there to go, this is hard for me and I'm still working out how I cope with it you know, mm-hmm. and you should have the support there in that movement. Mm-hmm, 100%. Now, going back to body acceptance, what, how are you accepting your body? I know just before we got into the show, you and I were having a little catch up and you were talking about uh, being naked. <laughs> Don't start a no remember Um, I hate that (laughs) you hate ASMR (laughs) yeah I feel as though like a tip for anyone out there who's you know if we want to talk about a few tips things that have worked for me personally and I know what works for me is not going to work for everyone but I feel as though one of the biggest things that has really helped me um, is that the older I've gotten the more comfortable I've gotten in my body I have been more likely and more inclined to be nude more often so these days wherever possible, I try and be naked. So I will do some cleaning naked. I will dance around in my underwear. I will do yoga naked. Sometimes I'll walk around naked during the day, full light, you know, around the house. I sleep naked. Like I do a lot of stuff in the world naked and I do it because it helps me to get more acclimatized to my body. I feel as though you become desensitized to how your body exists when you do things in it completely nude that are not considered sexual things it desexualizes your body and it removes it from the need to be judged uh from an aesthetic position because it's not about it being beautiful it's just about it being a body that you know you're moving through the world in if that makes sense so I have found being naked more often really helps me the more I'm naked the more comfortable I am in my body I'm so comfortable being nude now that I went and swam at the pool the other day and when I went to the change room I just stripped off and then I realized that I was naked in the change room in front of people and I was like right because people started looking at me a bit uncomfortable (laughs) like try not to look and I was like oh yeah no that's weird to people I forgot (laughs) it's weird to be naked in front of people okay fair enough but that's Um, the thing it's not weird for you 
it's weird for it's them. Not weird for me. And the yeah. bigger question for them is why is it weird for them? I remember, you know, I, you would have heard season two, episode one of my show. We had the Brendan Jones, who was the guy from Get Naked Australia, and he obviously does a lot of work to destigmatize the sexualizing, over sexualizing of people's bodies, and you know they celebrate bodies in all all their shapes, sizes, and colors, and everything, and there he actually had his not long after we released that episode his um instagram account for that for get naked australia got banned for like a whole year that's horrible mm-hmm. it only so went back up, because um, they were so recently. careful about how they posted i know and you look at some of the content that other people are posting that is not body positive it's like guys with a boner in their shorts and that's not getting banned from places yeah. like Instagram, but somebody out in nature just with their bum on show with a little pixelated bum crack is not acceptable. Mm. There's a problem here. Um, mm. But yeah, I completely agree with you in terms of being naked and and sort of being Do you embrace to- nudity much, Sean? Like are you a bit of a uh, nudist at home? I used to be, when I was in my early 20s, I was a bit of a prude when it came to nudity and that came from I think my own body hang-ups like don't get me wrong I would be fine if other people were nude I just wouldn't want to be walking around the house uh in in my underwear or naked but now I don't care like now I'm quite happy to be in my nude at my home mm. um yeah like it's fine to me it is really just it is a vessel in which I I go about my day and it's my body I don't like it like here you go I've got shorts on I probably I've got my zoom outfit on but I don't like this bit Mm. no the one that I mean just like I feel you and like I have a belly and it's jiggly and you know what's your t-shirt I'm fine with it like I'm fine with it like it's not look you stood up and your t-shirt said butt creepy what (laughs) <laughs> You're gonna have to show me what your t-shirt says now. <laughs> Cute but Cute, creepy. But creepy. Okay. But yeah, that's you know, something. like I've got a belly, and I am like very aware of it. And it's something that society says it's not okay. Let's talk about bellies for a minute. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk about little bellies because. When you're a baby, when you're a little child, when we see a little chubby creature of any kind, whether it's like you know a little animal or something the number one thing that we all say about it is, oh my God, that's so cute. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, look at this little belly and you just want to give it a little belly rub. We find it adorable in everything except adult human bodies and suddenly, ew. And it's like, why? Why though? <laughs> Makes no sense. It's absolute nonsense. Um, and But the, the problem is that I have with that is that my belly, I have a belly. I don't like my belly, obviously just said that. Um, I'll look at people on Instagram and social media and I'll be, and they don't have to be, you know, ripped. Just people who, you know, in a normal, what society would say is a normal body. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, of course. As if what I have is not good enough. Your body's beautiful, obviously. Thanks, girlfriend. You are, like, you're a gorgeous man. I think you are uh, I think you're sometimes aware of it, but sometimes maybe not so much. I think like everyone, you have insecurities, but you are obviously a very attractive man. You know, you look good. Your face is nice. Like you are a bit of a vampire. You haven't aged in 10 years. You're finally starting to age and you're like, what is this? Like, I get <laughs> it. What is I this gray it. hair? What is this going on? <laughs> um, but I, I will do that too. And like, stupidly, I will look at people who are mid-sized like me, but they have a slightly different like structure to their body where they've got bigger hips and I'm like oh I want slightly bigger hips because I've got big shoulders or they have like nicer lips and a smaller nose and I'll be like I want that and I don't have that and those little comparisons always creep in but you're you know the the thing that makes people I think most beautiful and the thing that's most attractive about these people that we compare ourselves with online is usually just that they're very comfortable with who they are they're very yeah. confident in who they are. And, you know, that's what we're actually relating to and liking about them. They're allowed and to be comfortable actually, and confident because they're gorgeous. Exactly. But like, you know, we're coveting 
actually not the physical attribute, but the the purity of their, you know, acceptance of themselves, I think. Yeah. And it's actually just translating to us as being a physical attribute, but really it's to do with them liking who they are and being comfortable with who they are. That's just one theory I have. I did have a couple more tips though, before we got off topic about, we were talking about being nude, helping you accept your body. Another big tip I would have for people is that when you are going through a phase where you're not entirely happy with how you look and you're struggling to accept your body at the moment, I would recommend buying yourself clothes that are made out of nice material, things that feel good against your skin. You know, whether for you that's velvet or satin or silk or whatever it might be. Like I don't do silk because I'm vegan, but you know, whatever it is that feels nice against your skin that makes you feel good in it, buy shit that looks good on you wear stuff that if you've got, you know, if you've got great boobs and you love your boobs and show them off, if you, if you like your ass then wear high cut shorts, just embrace the parts of your body that you love most, show them off and be comfortable with, you know, exposing and getting into those, you know, kind of outfits. Even if you're going to have a little bit of a belly there, it really doesn't matter if that's visible. You've just got to, you know, embrace that along with everything else and just sort of focus on the parts that you enjoy more and it helps you accept the other parts, I think. I think, yeah, I would agree. I guess my concern would be don't do that, though, if you're not comfortable doing it. Because then, of course, you'll go out into the world and you'll be conscious of of those, you know, other areas or whatever that um, you're not comfortable with. And that would be that would be a worry. Don't do it if you yeah. only do it if you're confident enough and comfortable enough. And if you're not, oh, sure. you'll get there because body acceptance. And what I can say about body acceptance is that I found, and you sort of touched on it before, the older I've gotten, the more accepting I am of my body. And I think, I, I guess you've got some mileage and you kind of go, oh, I appreciate the fact that you didn't give out on me when I was drinking so much in my early 20s. Um, and we're still yeah. going strong. <laughs> Good on your liver. But um, you kind of accept your body a little bit more like in that instance. And I think as you get older, you kind of, you stop giving so much of a shit about what everybody else thinks. And this is still Mm. a journey that I'm on. I like, I still give a shit, but less so than I did 10 years ago. And that I think is a real big part of body acceptance. And it's a shame for a lot of people that they don't get there sooner, that you have to get through a bit of the life to learn to sort of love the skin you're in because I mean if I it's another one of my little jokes the my inappropriate jokes I shouldn't say is you know I wish I was as I wish I was as fat as I was no I wish I was as thin as I was when I used to think I was fat Mm. Um, and that just sort of I guess you look looking back and you kind of don't appreciate the fact that you know youth and all of these things that you actually were pretty good the whole time and it's just society at that time made you feel like you were not enough and then as the years go on and you look back you can go you know what 10 15 years ago I actually was enough and I wish that that younger version of me knew what I know now but you know that's life you gotta gotta cross a lot of water under the bridge to get to where we're at now Absolutely. I I think that too, about, you know, previous incantations that I've been in, like when I was a teenager, when I was in my early twenties, all the struggles that I had then, the way I thought of myself then, you know, which is so silly, but I think we were policing other bodies a lot more heavily. And as a result, policing our own bodies back Mm -hmm. then, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was so much more policing of bodies. And I think I would have, and did receive and a lot more judgment for how I was these days, I, I am most of the time in a crop top of some kind. And, you know, that is like a strange thing because 15 years ago, I would never have been. And had I been, people would have gone, uh, are you sure you should wear that? Like, I would have gotten <laughs> comments like that. Like their and opinions people just, actually matter. Yeah. Yeah. And you just don't see as much of that anymore because people, I think, are beginning to cotton on to the fact that it's not okay to comment on other people's bodies. And, you know, you should just sort of back up and like, if you've got an opinion, keep it to yourself, you know, don't judge other people. I also think that like we've kind of spoken about, people are actually um, more accepting and more kind of like less 
I guess, policey about people's, yeah, appearance now. They're more like, oh, that's great. I think people are more encouraging of people accepting their bodies. And back then their whole attitude was different. And it was so much more, yeah, like tell everyone else that they're wrong because everyone else didn't like their body. Like no matter who you were, no matter how skinny you were or whatever, there was stuff that you were unhappy with about your body back then. And you were policing everyone else while policing yourself, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, so body neutrality was the other um, topic that I wanted to touch on. So instead of focusing on loving how your body looks, no matter what, or on accepting your body as it is, body neutrality is a philosophy that believes bodies are neither good nor bad. Body neutrality is also the idea that we can still care for our bodies, even if we don't view them positively. It is a relatively new concept, which has been popularized by bloggers, celebrities, and intuitive eating coaches who have helped to promote the idea that physical appearance does not determine self-worth. Body neutrality does not require that you love your body all the time, which can be a heavy ask for people who have been taught to hate their bodies for years and even decades. Okay, go. So I think that that's a very important term and obviously like it changes from person to person what that means for you. But for me, that's been a big part of my journey to realizing that I'm not entirely cis, like I'm not an entirely cisgendered person and I exist in a more in-between space where I present feminine a lot of the time because I don't have to owe the world, you know, like uh, androgyny to appear non-binary but I think that I sort of move between feeling feminine and feeling non-binary and just like a human being and part of that is realizing that I feel quite neutral about my body and about my gender expression when I'm not performing femininity so that's been a huge part of how I've sort of come to accept the only thing that really frustrates me is that I have such large breasts it's really obvious that I'm still a like um female born body when I'm wearing baggy clothes and that kind of bothers me, but I, I am on the pro I'm going through the process of dealing with that in a neutral kind of way. So that's been a part of it. I think. It's, it's interesting because, you know, there are two birth genders essentially. Um, But, you know, you don't have to identify as either or any at all. Um, I really embrace this journey for you because I think, I think it's great. And when you first mentioned it to me, I found it, you know, it just all sort of makes sense. You know, when you talk about um, the performance of the femininity side of things where, you know, it essentially, you know, for a lot of women out there, day to day is a performance. Like you literally are putting on a face every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and not something that has been asked of men, cis white well, men in general. It's not something that, that society has said, hey, can you just not look like that? And can you make yourself look better? Thanks. Great. Um, <laughs> so when you were talking about the performance of it all, and then, you know, when you're at home, you're likely to be found in, you know, overalls and oversized clothes and, you know, essentially just comfortable clothes. Like you don't, you're not in that performance space. Um, I just, I, I found the whole, the way you worded it and the way you explained it to me when you you told me, it all just made perfect sense. And I love that for you because it's very much who you are. And I know you not as, you know, I know you, to me, you're always Rochelle. That's, mm. you're not, you know, you're not, I don't, sounds strange. Don't always view you as a woman. I view you as Rochelle. Yeah, no, you view me as a human. Well, yeah. I think that we we remove some of that gender expression when we come to know other human beings very like properly. Um, we don't necessarily associate their gender so heavily with who we know them to be as a human being. But I feel like gender plays such an important role in how we relate to the world. And like you said, there's so much performance there. So I think what made me first realize that I wasn't cis as a part of my kind of body neutral sort of, um, you know, acceptance um, was I shot a video where I was doing something and I just had this realization when I was viewing the video back and editing it and I wasn't wearing any makeup and I hadn't done anything to like, you know, 
perform as female. I was like, oh, I'm just a, I'm, I'm a human. That's not a female. That's not a woman. That's just a human. That's just a person. And I feel as though it's something that a lot of people actually feel that, that kind of um, in-between space of not being like, you know, specifically one gender or another. Um, I think it's very common people who are on the spectrum as well. And people, you know, who kind of exist in that space where they're neurodivergent. And so it's not, you know, as clearly associated to one end of the spectrum or the other. But I also find it interesting that for a very long time, the way that I performed femininity was in a acceptable male pleasing kind of way. And it was derived from what was considered traditionally and, you know, of the moment attractive for men at this point, which, you know, is often kind of like leaning towards feminine, pretty and, you know, natural hair colors, natural looking makeup, we don't want anything a bit too much. The more that I express just as myself and as a human being, the more I'm like playing with color and, you know, just getting really comfortable in who I am and comfortable with being as loud and bright and obnoxious as I want to be. Like I've now taken to doing my makeup with like the four white dots, which is like, I don't know if you can see. I, oh, I can see too. Yeah. So it goes dot, 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 dot. And I like doing that and I like wearing color more often now, which I was always afraid to use because when I was younger, I remember being told like colorful makeup is unattractive. Men don't like that. And I had internalized so much misogyny and so much, you know, kind of like these, these attitudes about how gender works and about how I should perform my gender for the world, especially as a plus size, uh, you know, female or like, yeah. Um, assigned female birth person and I'm starting to unlearn so much of that and that's been a huge part of getting comfortable like my YouTube videos I have one up today or yesterday it went up um, of dyeing my hair pink and in it for 14 minutes like it's a 14 minute video for about 12 of those minutes I'm wearing no makeup it's a really bad angle <laughs> I'm like putting hair dye on things and like doing this and just looking like I look, you know, not great for like what we consider looking great, but it doesn't bother me to appear, you know, quote unquote, unattractive by society standards for women, because I don't see myself entirely as a woman. And it helps me to divorce from that as well. And to unlearn those expectations on my body. So that's, I guess, a complicated path to body neutrality, but yeah. Clapping for you. Um, yeah. I like this. I like this journey for you. And I'd like to, you know, I think it's an interesting, I guess, angle to the conversation about body positivity, body neutrality and acceptance. Like mm -hmm. for me, my voice always comes up because as I've mentioned in a previous episode, it's not the most masculine of voices. And, you know, I've been mistaken for, for many, a woman many a time. And when I was younger and I had not hair like this, but it was, you know, slightly longer for boys. All the other guys around that time had, you know, shaved heads and really short heads, spiky hair and, you know, early 2000 looks. And my kind of had that floppy hair going on and I was clean shaven. I would have, you know, little kids would sometimes say to me, are you a boy or a girl? And I would always find it so offensive, but they're innocent. Mm. Like it's, you know, if it was coming from, somebody who was in their thirties and maybe I'd have a problem, but yeah. Um, yeah, like that, my voice is part of my identity and it's always been like, I'll, I'll pick up the phone to, to phone a bank or whatever. And I'll have to go deeper in my voice. Hello. Like it still doesn't sound great. In that way, <laughs> in that way, aren't you performing masculinity in the way that society views? Not well. Like, not <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're like, I need some acting <laughs> lessons on masculinity. <laughs> um, but I mean, it kind of falls under that thing. Like everybody is different in, you know, we're all unique, wonderful little unicorns that are floating around the galaxy and can't everybody just be who they are? Like, why, why do I have mm -hmm. to have as a, as a guy, why do I have to have a deep voice um, to be considered masculine you know I firstly I, I grew I ended up growing a beard because I was like well this is going to help 
<laughs> and it did. But, you know, it's, it's all about acceptance. I accept yeah. it as my voice now. It's taken a long time to get here. But, you know, doing things, like you say before, about um, being uncomfortable. You know, you sometimes you have to be uncomfortable to get to the good place. And so, you know, for me during the podcast, putting my voice out there, being uncomfortable with the way my voice sounds to other people, not to me, like I like it, it's mine now, like I'm, I'm okay with it. But by putting it out there allowed me to, I guess, really embrace it and accept it as part of me. And it's like, you know, being naked. If you're uncomfortable mm. being naked in a private space, maybe you should be naked in a private space more often until it's no longer yeah. uncomfortable. Um, because at the end of the day, we're, we're here for a, a short time. We're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. So we need to embrace the bodies that we're in. We need to accept it um, yeah. to be able to really enjoy our time here. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I think that often we are uncomfortable when we're in that place of growth. You know, we're at our most uncomfortable when we're, we're, we're growing and we're having those growing pains, whether it's personally and emotionally or whatever it might be. It's often when you are like, oh, you're in a place of growth and it feels uncomfortable because the habits and the person that you used to be, you're not going to be anymore. So falling back into them doesn't feel right anymore. And as you sort of like establish who you're becoming, it's hard to find any um, safe spaces because you're changing and establishing what those are going to be once you've changed into who you're going to be next. We're always growing though. I think everyone is always in different phases of growth mm -hmm. and it often is an uncomfortable feeling and in a situation like this where it's personal growth and it's about coming to accept yourself more, it's very hard to get to that place. But what was uncomfortable becomes like a comfortable space and a comforting space over time because you do it enough and you get there. Like I am so comfortable being naked now. And when we come home, I'm often like, turn on the heater, stripping off. And Daniel's like, it's five degrees. West of the <laughs> and I'm like, just turn the heater on, okay? gonna walk around nude for a little while <laughs> so michelle i think we've covered a lot of ground here with this one and as we said at the top of the show there's always going to be a bigger conversation than what we could have on this one little podcast um so i guess to wrap to wrap us up i'm gonna throw it to you to give us a final thought and just tell us again who you think we should be following and how uh, I guess people can embrace the body that they're in. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think my biggest takeaway from the experiences that I've had mostly comes back to just getting comfortable with existing in that in-between space. You know, I'm not always feeling really negative about my body. I'm not always feeling really positive but more and more, and with my gender expression too, like we've been talking about more and more, I feel that I exist in a space that is really in between all of these things. And there's nothing wrong with taking space in that in-between land and like not falling to either side. So I think my biggest takeaway for everyone would be to get comfortable being in the in-between space and being neutral about your body get naked more often go and follow megan jane crab that used to be body posse panda jamila jamil and probably also lizzo because she's a queen and yeah thank you so much for listening today guys it's been great having you here amazing thanks michelle always a pleasure having you here and i'm sure we will see you again before the season is out thank you <laughs>